I'm Dr. William Worrell. On behalf of the university and the Department of Psychology, I'd like to welcome you here on this very special occasion. Our guest speaker today, Noam Chomsky, is the best known and most widely recognized scholar intellectual in the world today. Not only has he made monumental contributions to the field of linguistics, but he has contributed much to the thinking and research of many other disciplines. For example, his work in psycholinguistics has become the foundation of psycholinguistics, a branch of psychology. Additionally, he opposed the strict environmental position of American behaviorism, specifically the views of J.B. Watson and B.F. Skinner. Professor Chomsky also ushered in the doctrine of nativism and made it respectable and viable in the interpretation and of an understanding human behavior, particularly um, how children learn to talk. At this point, I want to introduce to you the person who is primarily responsible for our guest's appearance today. Mr. Eric Epstein, an undergraduate psychology major, <clears throat> asked our guest to speak here and uh, if it weren't for him, we probably wouldn't be assembled together here today. So I think that it is proper and fitting that Mr. Epstein Stein make the formal introduction of our guest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wall. When the plans were finalized for Professor Chomsky's lecture, and we started to let people know about his talk, I heard some interesting reactions. How did you get, according to the New York Times, arguably the most important intellectual alive, America's leading social critic, author of over 70 books, to agree to speak at Kutztown University? My response was very simple. We just called him up and asked him. <laughs> In fact, Professor Chomsky will talk to anyone who's willing to listen. Noam Chomsky has spoken to more college students than any other speaker in the world, presenting his thesis and motivating us to critically think. I also heard other reactions, such as, who is Noam Chomsky? I'm a political science and journalism major, a senior. I'm sure I would have heard of him if he was all of that. Although Professor Chomsky is quite well known in many circles, his dissenting views and numerous books are seldom discussed in political science or journalism courses, because I believe they reveal too much about our society and how it really functions. Professor Chomsky's undergraduate and graduate years were spent at the University of Pennsylvania, where he received his PhD in linguistics in 1955. During the years 1951 to 1955, he was a junior fellow of the Harvard University Society of Fellows. He is an institute professor at MIT, where he's been since 1955. Over the last 40 years, he has revolutionized the field of linguistics. From 1966 to 1976, Professor Sean Chomsky held the Ferrari P. Ward Professorship of Modern Languages and Linguistics. During the years 1958 to 1959, Professor Chomsky was in residence at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, New Jersey. In the spring of 1969, he delivered the John Locke Lectures at Oxford. In January 1970, he delivered the Bertrand Russell Memorial Lecture at Cambridge University. In 1972, the Nehru Memorial Lecture in New Delhi. And in 1977, the Huizinga Lecture in Leiden. Professor Chomsky has received honorary degrees from the University of London, the University of Massachusetts, 
and the University of Pennsylvania, to mention a few. He is a recipient of the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award of the American Psychological Association and the Kyoto Prize from Japan. In addition to his widely recognized academic contributions, Professor Chomsky is America's leading dissident intellectual, and again, according to the Times, perhaps the clearest voice of dissent in American history. Professor Chomsky challenges us to recognize the sickening hypocrisies in our establishment's claims, supposedly in the support of freedom and democracy at home and abroad, as well as to recognize the flood of lies and distortions present in every area of mainstream political discourse. He inspires us to question authority and conventional wisdom in all aspects of life, personal, political, and academic, as well as to think about our responsibility to act on our decent human instincts. Professor Chomsky will speak on some comments on the academic and political world, totalitarian values in a free society. Noam Chomsky. Before I speak about anything, are you getting the same echo that I'm getting up here? No? OK. Uh, I was afraid that somehow these two mics were interacting in an unpleasant fashion. Uh, so I'll, I'll just suffer with it as long as you don't have to. Uh, the, uh, the topic that was suggested to me, uh, totalitarian values in a free society, uh, sounds like a contradiction at first. Uh, but it actually isn't. Uh, in fact, it's a rather traditional theme, though it's not usually put in those words. Uh, it has to, the, the issue arises from a basic problem in the theory of government, if you like, that was discussed, among others, by David Hume a couple hundred years ago in his uh, fundamental work in political philosophy. Uh, Hume was puzzled by the fact that people submit to authority. Uh, and he wondered why that is true. Uh, and he posed a kind of paradox of government. Uh, the paradox is that power lies in the hands of the governed, people who are being governed. So why don't they use it? Uh, why do they listen to their rulers? Uh, and his conclusion was that uh, the way that that happens is through control over opinion. Uh, if you can't control the opinion of the of those who are ruled, they would simply rise up and take power for themselves. Uh, and he concluded that this is true of uh, all societies from the most despotic to the most free. Uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to that doctrine, although it does require two comments, I think. Uh, one is that Hume very much underestimated the degree of violence that is in the hands of uh, powerful states uh, and that can control people even if they, no matter what their opinions are. Uh, that was true in his day and it's even more dramatically true in our day. So if you were uh, a dissident in, say, uh, pre-Gorbachev Russia, uh, life could be pretty unpleasant. Uh, in the days of Stalin, terribly unpleasant. In the post-war period, it could mean exile or uh, punishment of one sort or another uh, and varying degrees of unpleasantness. Uh, if you're a dissident in a typical U.S. dependency, like, say, El Salvador or Guatemala, uh, you're likely to end up by a roadside uh, cut into shreds with machete after being tortured. Uh, if you're a dissident in other U.S. dependencies today, like, say, Haiti, uh, you're, again, likely to be tortured or, say, murdered, as uh, one of President Aristide's leading backers was the other day. Uh, and if you're still alive, you can listen to... Uh, you can read this morning's New York Times and discover that the United States isn't going to do anything about it. Uh, they'll send down observers, but they'll only observe the torture and the terror. They won't be authorized to uh, interfere with it. Well, there are various ways, in short, of controlling dissidents by extreme violence, uh, and we should know all about them since we run some of the worst of them. Uh, uh, that's one problem. 
uh, in Hume's account. It's not the case that in the most despotic societies, control of opinion is really necessary. There are other means. Uh, but he's right about the societies that are more free. When the government loses the capacity, when state power or other domestic power loses the capacity to control people by violence, it naturally turns to control of opinion and seeks to install totalitarian values in one or another form. In fact, I think a proper emendation of Hume's paradox doctrine would be that uh, a control of thought is much more significant and much more important as societies become more free for the obvious reason that if you can't control people by the bludgeon, but you're committed to controlling them, that is, it is an inegalitarian society with power, with power highly concentrated, as is every existing society, uh, past and present, uh, then uh, you must turn to other means of control, and control of opinion is about the only one left, as, far, as Hume recognized. Uh, furthermore, that conclusion has been pretty widely understood in the West. In fact, it's a leading doctrine of modern uh, political science and modern uh, political leadership and certainly of the corporate community, often articulated quite explicitly uh, throughout this century, and in fact we can trace it back hundreds of years. Uh, in the modern period, say take World War II, the, what I've proposed as an e World War I, uh, the emendation that I proposed to Hume's doctrine, namely that you need control of opinion much more in the more free societies, uh, that was pretty clear in World War I. The more free societies were the Anglo-American ones. The more autocratic society was German. Uh, and in fact, uh, Britain and the United States uh, far, uh, had by far the greatest achievements uh, in propaganda and thought control during World War I, a fact which was noticed uh, and has been quite influential for the period that followed. Uh, Woodrow Wilson had a problem when he was elected president in 1916. The problem was that he was elected on the program of uh, peace without victory, but he was committed to victory without peace, so something had to be done about that. Uh, and in fact, the country had to be somehow turned from a pacifist country uh, into a country of uh, raving jingoist warmongers. Well, that took about six months. Uh, after a, under a huge propaganda campaign of a kind which was quite unprecedented uh, with the leadership of progressive intellectuals, I should say, people in John Dewey's circle who later took uh, great pride in this achievement. They described this as the first time that a country had been driven to war not by you know, generals and uh, kings and so on, but by the more intelligent members of the community, namely ourselves. Anybody who speaks is one of the more intelligent members of the community. Uh, and they, uh, the more intelligent members of the community had succeeded in bringing the population to understand why we must go to war, uh, using materials provided for them by British intelligence, uh, which had committed itself, as they put it, to controlling the thought of the world, and was quite happy to provide uh, fabricated uh, horror stories about Belgian children with their arms torn off and all sorts of other stuff, which in fact you often still read about in history books, but which was mostly fabricated by British intelligence uh, and the whole pile of other stuff. And uh, the, the Wilson administration, liberal Wilson administration, progressives, in order to facilitate this, set up the first government propaganda agency, Creel Commission, uh, which was specifically committed to controlling thought. Its major task was to uh, build up support for an extremely unpopular war, and its later tasks were to, uh, I'll come to them. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, and it was very successful. Uh, one of the founders of modern American political science, Harold Laswell, uh, who is in, in particular the founder of the field that's called communications and so on, which basically means propaganda, uh, he uh, began his career with a study of uh, propaganda during the First World War. He described Woodrow Wilson as the generalissimo of propaganda, uh, and he was uh, uh, much impressed by the achievements of the Creel Commission in uh, bringing the population into hysterical support for a war that they opposed, and all sorts of jingoist fanaticism, I mean, hatred of all things German, and this and that and the other thing. 
uh, simply by propaganda, most of it fabricated, a lot of it provided by British intelligence services. Uh, well, as I say, a lot of people noticed this. Uh, one of the people who noticed it was Harold Laswell, and it fed into a major part of contemporary political science. Uh, uh, those undergraduates in political science who you were talking about certainly have heard of Harold Laswell, but I doubt very much that they have read his work on propaganda, which is quite interesting. Uh, another person who noticed this and was influenced by it was Adolf Hitler. Uh, if you read Mein Kampf, uh, you'll find that a large part of it is devoted to his recognition of the great achievements of Anglo-American propaganda and the inability of much more authoritarian Germany to counter it. I mean, the Germans tried to answer the arguments, but they were just wiped out in the, com in the competition. Uh, British and American propaganda systems were far superior and more effective, and they essentially massacred them. And Hitler noticed that and uh, determined that uh, next time around, uh, the German side would have an efficient propaganda system, which in fact he went on to develop under Nazism. Although, if we were to really do a comparative analysis, it's not at all clear that he ever came close to the achievements of British and American propaganda, even at that period. That's something that could be looked at. Uh, a, uh, uh, another, uh, I, I should say this went right on into the Second World War. So for example, when Franklin Roosevelt this is quite independent of whether you think it's right to get into the war or wrong to get into it. I'm just describing what happened. Uh, a couple of months before Pearl Harbor, when President Roosevelt was trying to build up support for war for the war in, uh, uh, in, in, in the United States, it was a very pacifist country at that time. We didn't see any point in getting involved in European conflict. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of his major speeches uh, showed a big map of the Western Hemisphere, uh, which he said was a German map, and that uh, described the plans of Germany to conquer the entire Western Hemisphere. And the, the map was in fact real. Uh, it had been provided by British intelligence who had fabricated it again, and who were very eager to get the U.S. into war. And such uh, uh, efforts went on, and they were very intensive. Anybody my age can remember them. Uh, uh, from the Second World War, they were quite something to see. Uh, well, uh, political scientists and uh, Adolf Hitler uh, recognized the achievements of the propaganda, of the generalissimo of propaganda, Woodrow Wilson, uh, but probably more significant in, for the long term was that the American business community was very much impressed by this. Uh, one of the members of the Creole Commission, the Woodrow Wilson uh, Propaganda Commission, was uh, Edward Bernays, who just had his 101st birthday a day or two ago, uh, who is sort of the grand old man of the American public relations industry, so one of the great founders of the PR industry. Uh, he was in the Creel Commission, and he recognized that you really can do a lot to uh, control people's minds through propaganda, and he thought this ought to be put to use, and there are people around who pay for that sort of thing, uh, so you put it to use for the people who are going to pay for it, which means the business community. Now that didn't initiate uh, the uh, use of the, the PR industry, the pro public relations industry is a huge industry. It's an American invention. Uh, nobody knows quite how big it is because private corporations are immune to public inspection. You know, governments sometimes leak documents, but corporations don't. Uh, so that's real totalitarian private power. You can't get into it. But occasionally some material comes out in you know, Senate inquiries or something. The last one I saw was about late 70s when it was estimated that the PR industry spends about a billion dollars a year in grassroots propaganda uh, and unknown further amounts in what is sometimes called treetop propaganda, that is trying to get after smart guys, you know. Uh, universities and uh, academic institutions and educated people, folks like us, in other words. Uh, and there's unknown amounts spent in that, and maybe a billion dollars for grassroots propaganda at that time, undoubtedly far higher since. Uh, the PR industry took off in the early part of this century. Uh, that was a period when American capitalism was undergoing a change 
from a more or less, uh, I mean, some, some degree of proprietary competitive capitalism to highly administered uh, centralized capitalism under big corporate control. It was the period when people were worried about trusts and things like that. Uh, it was, we always had a very interventionist state. Uh, nobody ever believed that capitalism could function, but it used to be more, more competitive and more proprietary in the 19th century, and there was a big change taking place. And there was a lot of concern about it. People didn't like the trusts, uh, for one thing, because they were so corrupt, uh, and for another thing, because they were so violent. Uh, it was a period of, they had power over the, they had state power at their hands. Uh, people who lived around here back in that period know that very well. Uh, violent strike breaking and terror in Pennsylvania was notorious, in fact, for the use of state terror to uh, violently suppress uh, labor organization and that sort of thing, Homestead being the major example. Uh, the, uh, uh, so there was a lot of concern in the country about this shift, and the, uh, there was a lot of hatred of the new magnates, uh, John Rockefeller and you know, those guys. Uh, and the PR industry was in fact developed as an attempt to deal with this, uh, to bring people to accept these folks as sort of nice, friendly people who were trying to help us all out. Uh, and uh, it took off at that period, and it was pretty successful. In fact, had remarkable success. Uh, with the First World War and this new insight into the importance and the ability to control people's thought by propaganda, it really took off. Uh, and immediately, the latter stage of the Second World War and afterwards, uh, there was an ex extraordinarily successful state business, uh, kind of state corporate uh, propaganda campaign, went well beyond propaganda, pretty violent too, uh, in order to try to destroy the incipient labor movement, uh, to smash up strikes, uh, to uh, destroy and to demolish independent thought, to stop independent politics, to, main, to place the country under really total business control. Uh, Wilson's Red Scare was a large part of this, thousands of people exiled and so on, uh, and it was very successful. In the 1920s, the country was very passive. You know, it was strictly under business control, and in fact, the business community thought that this achievement had, uh, everyone thought pretty much that this achievement had succeeded in beating back the threat of democracy in the United States, probably permanently, the threat of democracy and uh, labor organizing. Well, that, uh, that belief uh, collapsed, and the, and it's at that point that the PR industry really took off uh, with people, um, program with quite quite frankly incidentally you look at the books written at that time they're all about propaganda and the need for propaganda in a free society and how you have to control people and so on and so forth uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the 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 phrases that were used were things like you know you have to control the public mind because the public mind is the greatest threat to corporations pretty much Hume's doctrine but now applied to private power, not just to government power. Uh, the, uh, in the 1930s, the, to, to every, with the big depression, the passivity of the population was broken. There was a new democratic thrust. American workers began to organize. They finally got the rights that had been achieved in Europe uh, decades earlier. Uh, and this uh, rising threat of democracy and uh, social justice uh, really sent fear into the business community. Again, the National Association of Manufacturers at that time was writing about what they called the hazard facing industrialists in the rising political power of the masses. Uh, you'll notice the kind of vulgar Marxist tinge to that, but that's common in the business literature and also in government documents. It reads like vulgar Marxist texts usually. It's just that all the values are inverted. The terminology is the same. It's a highly class conscious group. Uh, so they were very much worried about the rising political power of the masses, uh, which is a the greatest hazard facing industrialists. And uh, I'm just quoting from NAM literature. They uh, said that their thinking, the thinking of the masses, must be directed to more proper channels, or we are definitely headed for adversity. Uh, well, again, a big campaign started in the latter part of the 1930s, the latter part of the Roosevelt administration. In part, it used the traditional methods, a resort to state violence, 
to murder strikers and so on. That was going on right around here, incidentally, in the little steel strikes in the late 30s. But more and more, they began to uh, rely on uh, thought control as a more efficacious device of controlling people than violence, uh, and also one more available in a, much, in a society that was really becoming more free when the government didn't have the power, it was losing the power to control people by the bludgeon. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, so you began to, that's at the, the time when right in Pennsylvania, in fact, you found that they experimented with what were called scientific methods of strike breaking, uh, meaning ways, uh, formulas for moving into a community with massive public relations campaigns to try to convince the population that there's a split between us and them, you know. Us, we guys, are the uh, sober working man, the housewife taking care of her children, you know, the uh, storekeeper tending, taking care of his store, the executive in the local corporation laboring day and night for the benefit of the entire population and so on, that's us. And them are foreigners who are trying to come in and break up our harmony and attack Americanism and destroy our values and uh, disrupt their lives and so on, like the ones who are trying to organize the CIO, let's say. Uh, these campaigns had an enormous amount of, uh, 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 this also it involved lots of other things, but that was the basic story. Try to set up a picture of harmony and Americanism on the one side, uh, uh, which is classless, of course, and disruption and you know, anarchism and uh, you know, Bolshevism, and you pick it on the other side, uh, which was going to disrupt all of this nice stuff. That presents a particular vision of what America is. America is a class dictatorship run by the business community the way it was in the 1920s with everybody else passive and marginalized. That's Americanism and the people who disrupt that are anti-American and against our lives and against our communities and we've got to stop them. Uh, well, that was the main theme and it turned out to be pretty successful. In fact, business was quite impressed by these uh, scientific methods of strike breaking as they were called. The project was put on hold during the Second World War, you know, there was another thing to worry about, uh, but it was picked up very quickly right afterwards. And immediately after the Second World War, a huge campaign developed to try to beat back the threat of democracy and social movements and so on that had developed, in fact, during the 1930s, and it was extremely successful. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the United States is off the international spectrum on most issues, like, say, workers' rights or health. Or in, everybody's talking about health now. And as everyone knows, this is the only industrial country that doesn't have some form of national health care. Everybody else has it and has had it forever. Uh, it's much more efficient, it's much cheaper, it reaches a lot more people, it doesn't have all the problems of the highly bureaucratized and inefficient uh, privately-based systems. Uh, but we can't have it. Uh, and in fact, it was proposed. It was proposed by Harry Truman, in fact, back in the mid-40s, and beaten back by a huge lobbying campaign of business, precisely on the basis that I described. Anti-American, opposed to harmony, attacking our fundamental rights, uh, pointy-headed bureaucrats, Bolsheviks, I mean, usual business. And it was successful. Now, remember, there's no counterpart to corporate propaganda. They own the place. So when there's a propaganda campaign, it's like 99% on one side, and maybe 1% on the other. Uh, and in fact, Truman later uh, uh, objected. If you look at his own writings and biography. He, he described this as the biggest business campaign in history, which had simply eliminated the possibility of uh, elementary social justice, the kind that you have in just about every other country, let alone efficiencies, much more efficient, these other systems. Uh, the, uh, uh, in the United States. That was a major achievement. We're going through another phase of it right now, so it's worth looking at. Uh, another example was the Office of Price Administration. Uh, there were huge wartime profits, but prices were kept down, uh, wages were kept down. Uh, and the Office of Price Administration had some effect on lowering prices so that people could buy things. Business was naturally strongly opposed to that. The public was strongly in favor of continuing it. So if you look at polls around 1945, it's like you know 80% in favor of continuing it. Uh, business again launched a huge public relations campaign, with, with, which within about six months had turned the figures around. Uh, and about 80%, uh, you know, I forget the figures, like 75% opposition and so on, and Congress 
smashed it. Uh, well, these again are great achievements of propaganda. They were noticed. I mean, it was no, uh, it, uh, the next thing that came along was the Taft-Hartley bill, which essentially terminated the possibility of labor organizing. And it was followed by various other things. One of the reasons why the United States has, is now, has now one of the weakest labor movements in the world, in the industrial world, you know, like not as bad as some fascist country. But uh, in the sort of advanced industrial world, the United States is again off the spectrum on labor rights. In fact, astonishingly, the United States was condemned last year by the International Labor Organization, which never condemns any of its rich sponsors. Uh, because the United States was the only industrial country that wasn't permitting the right to strike, uh, meaning it was allowing what are called permanent replacement workers, meaning you go on strike, we hire scabs, and you're out. Uh, and that's a rapid, gross violation of international labor standards, uh, but uh, has been building up in the United States and finally succeeded. Uh, Reagan pushed it through with the uh, uh, flight, uh, what do you call them? Pa yeah, Packer, yeah, the guys who run the control towers, I uh, forget the name for them, and it really ran through with uh, the Caterpillar strike in 1992, which was a major event, which caused, in fact, the uh, condemnation. So the United States is well off the international spectrum on that one again. And remember, this is the most free society in the world. I mean, this is, it is, in fact. This is, there's no other country, at least none that I know of, where the government is so constrained in its capacity to interfere and control you know, to, to sort of stop free speech or, you know, break into newspapers or whatever. Very, comparatively speaking, very free country. Consequently, I think, much more committed to totalitarian values uh, because they're necessary. You have to control people somehow, and it's better not to have things like labor movements and uh, organized populations and so on and so forth because they might do something with their freedom. You can't really control them by force. Uh, well, uh, that's, um, th th there's all sorts of um, uh, methods of doing this kind of thing. Let's go back to some of the thinking behind it. Uh, the, uh, uh, going back to, say, Howard, La uh, Howard Laswell, who's one of the original pioneers of this, uh, he, uh, in, back in the 20s and 30s, people used to be pretty frank. I mean, there's a kind of like less Orwellian society than today. So when they were involved in propaganda, they called it propaganda. So if you look at, say, the Encyclopedia of Social Sciences in 1933, there, in fact, is an essay on propaganda uh, written by Harold Laswell. Uh, and he describes how important it is, uh, particularly in free societies, like other serious analysts, he recognized that propaganda becomes more important uh, as you move away from more authoritarian societies, what nowadays we would call totalitarian societies, and use the term then. So as you move away from these, you've got to have a greater reliance on propaganda, uh, and uh, you know, which he said is, propaganda, he said, is as neutral as a pump handle. You can use it for good, you can use it for bad. He didn't raise the question of who's going to be pushing the pump. That's somebody else's domain. But propaganda is neutral, you know, good or bad. Uh, and, the, uh, and if you look at the distribution of power in the society, you can answer the unasked question. Uh, the re he also said propaganda is necessary uh, because, um, he said, we should, because of the ignorance and stupidity of the masses. Uh, he, uh, he said we should not succumb to what he called democratic dogmatisms about people being the best judges of their own interests. They're not. Uh, we smart guys are the best judges of their own interests, uh, and therefore we got to make sure that these ignorant and stupid masses don't enter the public arena, or, every, or they'll suffer too. I mean, they're much better off if we run the affairs for them. But unfortunately, you know, we can't send them to the gulag and put them in gas chambers and that sort of thing. So therefore, we have to control their thinking. That's the, he, he didn't say that, I'm adding that. But that's the uh, kind of logic that lies behind it, to put it in sort of crass, though not in accurate terms. Uh, the, uh, these views that he was developing then had in fact been articulated much more clearly and, and, uh, and in a way more influentially about a decade earlier by Walter Lippmann, who was sort of a you know, major commentator on public affairs, sort of the dean of American journalism, uh, and a, a leading progressive intellectual came out of the sort of Wilson Dewey school, uh, and, and who's, who had a background in the propaganda agencies of the First World War as well.
during the 1920s, he wrote extensively on these topics in what are called, if you pick up his essays in the bookstore, you'll notice they're called progressive essays on democracy. And they did represent the progressive view. The progressive view of democracy as Wilson developed it, uh, and as is constantly assumed, is that there are two categories of people. There are what he called the responsible men. That's us smart guys again. There's the responsible men who are a small group. And then there are those who he called the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders. That's the population. So there's a problem here. We got to make sure it's Hume's problem. Uh, how do we make sure that the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders don't meddle in what is none of their business, namely public affairs, and leave it to the responsible men? He said the main problem is, he said, to protect ourselves from the trampling and the rage of the bewildered herd. That's this huge mass of people out there. And if we, and this is all out of pure benevolence. I mean, it's just because we want to do help them, you know. We want to help them, and if this bewildered herd and starts meddling in stuff that's none of their business, there will be all kind of problems. Uh, so we have to do something, uh, and it's obvious what we have to do. We don't control them by force, we control them by propaganda, uh, and we try to reach a state which he described. He said, look, it's not a, not a, what we would nowadays call a totalitarian society, it's a free society. And in a free democratic society, he said the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders do have a function, because uh, it's democratic. Their function is to be spectators of action, not participants. Uh, and uh, they're allowed to look, in other words, uh, so you don't have to keep them in total ignorance. Uh, the, uh, 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 furthermore, they're allowed to participate in a very special fashion. Periodically, they are to be given an opportunity to lend their weight to one or another representative of the responsible men. That's called an election. Uh, and after that, they're supposed to go home and be spectators again. That's the role of the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders in a free society. Uh, and uh, as I say, and, and uh, uh, that, that's, I'm now giving the progressive view. There's a spectrum of views on this. This is the sort of liberal progressive side. It goes over to the reactionary side. Uh, when you get to the more reactionary side, like, say, the Reagan administration, uh, their view is that the population shouldn't even be spectators. Uh, so even the spectator role is to be excluded. And you can see it very clearly in their policies. I mean, they call themselves conservatives. So that's a joke. They were radical statists, believers in an extremely powerful state, which furthermore has to be, which grew enormously under the Reaganite years, I should say, and has to be, but has to be a welfare state for the rich. That's the point. Uh, it's a, so it's a big welfare state, but you know, for other people, you look at the change in income distribution and so on, you can see it. In fact, if you look at polls, you can see it. There's a reason why Reagan is uh, the most disliked ex living ex-president uh, today, ranking right alongside Richard Nixon, uh, a couple of percentage points of pardons, and particularly among working people and so-called Reagan Democrats, uh, and one of the most despised people in public life. There's a reason for that. Uh, uh, and the reason is ex exactly the system. Not that he had anything to do with it, you know, he was just like reading his lines, but the <laughs> people behind him were sort of put him up there to read the lines. Uh, they had a lot to do with it. And they were, uh, uh, they believed in a very powerful interventionist state in which the, five, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders aren't even supposed to be spectators. So the Reagan administration in introduced very high levels of censorship and secrecy unprecedented, in fact, to prevent the public from knowing what was going on. Uh, one of the reasons why clandestine operations shot up to such a peak, on, historically unprecedented peak in the Reagan administration, was that the purpose of clandestine, you know, when a government resorts to clandestine operations, that's a weapon against its own population. I mean, everybody else knows about them. You know, like if you run a clandestine terror war in Central America, the guys who are getting tortured and killed know all about it, and the dozens of other countries that are participating in it, you know, providing uh, uh, advi advisors for the state terrorists and funding it and so on, they know all about it. In fact, the only people who aren't supposed to know anything about it are the domestic population. That's what's called a clandestine operation. And the purpose of them is to keep the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders away from even the spectator role. The Reagan administration also instituted uh, a propaganda age, state propaganda agency, illegal as they later conceded when it was exposed, uh, uh, which was running something called Operation Truth, 
uh, Operation Truth was about what you'd expect after you read 1984. Uh, the idea was to try to propagandize the population into accepting you know, the various things they were up to, like demonizing the Sandinistas and whatever else they were up to. Uh, and uh, when it was finally exposed, actually, one of the Reagan officials uh, described it as, honestly, as the kind of operation you would carry out in enemy territory, he said, meaning we were carrying this operation out among the enemy, namely the population of the United States, uh, and they had to be kept from even seeing what was going on. So that's the reactionary end of the spectrum. And there is a choice, you know, democracy, democratic theory sort of falls between those limits. Uh, well, the, uh, uh, the, the, the post, going back to the Second World War, the post-Second World War propaganda campaign had very much the effects of the post-First World War propaganda campaign. It created a period of passivity, passivity and apathy. That's what's called the apathetic 50s. Uh, and it was real, very real. Uh, and uh, with a lot of repression and elimination of independent thought and so on and so forth. Uh, that broke down too, in this case not from a depression, but from the ferment of the 1960s, which sort of somehow broke through all this. I mean, interesting how it happened, but anyway, it did happen. Uh, and that again caused a tremendous fear and anger on the part of elites. In fact, there was a name for what happened. It was called a crisis of democracy. Uh, and in fact, there's a major study, which everyone should read, I always recommend it, called The Crisis of Democracy. Uh, library probably has it. Uh, published in 1975, it was the first major publication of the Trilateral Commission. A Trilateral Commission is a internet, it's trilateral because it's based in Europe, Japan, and the United States. It's sort of elites, and in fact, liberal elites, liberal internationally oriented elites from the three major power centers, uh, and their first major publication in 1975, in fact, really their only major publication, in fact, not the only interesting thing they've done, was to, this is the group out of which Carter came, and in fact, his entire cabinet came from there. That sort of identifies them in the political spectrum. Uh, they, uh, their first and only major publication was the crisis of democracy, and they were referring to the problems that arose in all the three trilateral areas in the 1960s. And what happened was, well, you, this threat of democracy was arising again. Uh, people, normally marginalized and apathetic people, were becoming, were entering into the public arena. They were becoming organized, they were beginning to think, they were asking questions, they were pressing their demands in public. You know, they were trying to take part in the public process to be something other than spectators. Uh, naive people could say that's democracy, but you know, if you're sophisticated, if you're one of the responsible, maybe you had a good education like you get here, I guess, uh, you know that that's a crisis of democracy that has to be beaten back, uh, and that's the way they described it. The, the American uh, spokesperson at this, a professor at Harvard, he's now a professor of the science of government at Harvard, I love that title. So the professor of the science of government at Harvard, Samuel Huntington, who was the American rapporteur at this thing, uh, he looked back kind of nostalgically to the days of the Truman administration when he said Truman was able to run the country with the help of a small group of Wall Street lawyers and financiers. And that was democracy, we had a crisis then. Uh, but now we've got this business of the 1960s with minorities and women and you know, young people and all sorts of normally marginalized and passive groups somehow trying to enter this system. And that's an, that makes the society ungovernable, he said problem of ungovernability, and the answer is obvious. You have to beat them back to passivity and obedience, uh, and since this is a free society, you can't do it by force, so you have to go back to methods of propaganda. And in fact, there's been a huge ideological campaign ever since then, trying to beat back the heresy. Uh, since you're living through it, I presume I don't have to talk about it a lot. Uh, well, um, uh, uh, in, in this case, I don't think it's been beaten back. It's interesting that it's been much less successful than it was in the 20s and the 50s, but it's in effect a very live issue right now. Uh, the, uh, uh, so, so just to summarize what I'm saying so far, the, there is absolutely nothing surprising about the fact, and indeed it is a fact, uh, that there are huge efforts to install totalitarian values uh, in, in intellectual culture uh, in a society that is more free. In fact, 
it's exactly what you expect, uh, and it's exactly what we find. Uh, in a country where, say, Stalinist Russia, you didn't really care that much about what people thought, because there were a lot of other ways to control them. Uh, and in fact, they, turns out, had a lot more access to information and alternative views and so on. It wasn't a big problem, there was nothing they could do about it anyway, or so they thought. Uh, so there were some studies done here by uh, uh, government-funded Russian research centers and so on in the late 1970s, trying to give some estimate of you know, where Russians, this isn't the worst period of Russian repression, you know, this Brezhnev days, uh, trying to find, but still totalitarian, uh, trying to see you know, what people read and what they listened to and where they were getting information from and so on. And you, know, you couldn't go in there and carry out polls, so the numbers you have to take with some you know, meant to be precise, their estimates. Uh, but the estimates are quite intriguing. Uh, it turned out that about three quarters of the population was listening to foreign broadcasts, meaning getting Western news regularly. Uh, and about 95% of the more educated sectors, white collar, you know, that sort of thing, were listening to foreign broadcasts. Uh, with regard to some is that, you know, illegal, technically illegal uh, underground dissident literature, you know, kind of pamphlet you hand out at a street corner. Uh, about 50, close to 50% of the sort of white collar, semi-educated people were reading them, and about 15% of blue collar workers were reading them. Well, you know, in the United States, the equivalent of some is that some dissident journal, you know, if it could reach 0.001% of the population, you know, everybody would be having parties at the nearest uh, local bar or something. Uh, but in a country that's disciplined, of course, nobody listens to foreign broadcasts. If you did a study here of who listens to foreign broadcasts, it would be statistically undetectable. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, that's important. You know, it's much more important in a free society to constrain the forms of information that reach people. Uh, if we were to look at the educational system, we would find similar things. Uh, and uh, it must, of course, have an appearance of, uh, it's got to be credible. So it's extremely important to have inside the media, for example, people who are considered to be critics, you know, critics, courageous critics of the system, uh, you know, liberal doves and that sort of thing. But they play a very, and their role is to give the system credibility, but in order, but nevertheless not to undermine it. So there's a very narrow definition of that role. Uh, it's somebody who accepts all the doctrines but gives a slightly soft slant to them. So, for example, if you, there's been a, there's a ton of documentation on this if you're interested. There's thousands of pages of details. But just to take one example of how it works, uh, which is well studied, uh, if you take, say, the, the 1980s, the biggest foreign policy issue uh, was how to destroy Nicaragua. I mean, that was the major propaganda issue. You know, we've got to run this terrorist war against Nicaragua which drives it down to what it now is, namely about the level of Haiti with tens of thousands of people starving, kids starving in the streets, being kept alive by women with soup kitchens and you know, political system destroyed and everything else. That was the goal. Bring it back to what was called the Central American mode by the liberal press, by the Washington Post and so on. So, and there, there was a debate about this. I mean, you all remember this huge issue in the 1980s. Uh, in fact, it was the major foreign policy issue now, if you look at the, uh, an, an interesting indication of the range of opinion and the role of liberal doves and critics is given by a study of the opinion that was permitted in the liberal press. The, we have two major national journals in the United States, the New York Times and the Washington Post, both of which are considered liberal. So the New York Times, for example, is described in the foreign policy literature as the establishment left. No, that's what it's called, in fact. So we, we, we just look at the establishment left and the Washington Post, which is considered even more liberal, which happened to be the most important because they're two big national papers. They set the framework within which most other papers and even television follows. They kind of give an agenda. Uh, if we look at the opinion pieces, uh, you know, op-eds, uh, editorials, and so on, in that over, over that period, what do we find? Well, actually, I did a study of that for the two, picking two periods when there was absolute peak intensity, you know, hundreds of 
op-eds coming out in a few months, uh, which is extremely unusual. And they were very revealing. Uh, they, uh, uh, there was, first of all, close to 100% agreement that the government of Nicaragua had to be overthrown. Uh, the only reason it wasn't 100% was that once in a while they'd allow a small statement by the ambassador of Nicaragua. And once in the entire period I looked at, they allowed an op-ed by somebody who actually knew something about the region. A doctor is the only person who ever knew anything about it. He was a medical uh, a person who was involved in medicine in the Caribbean region who simply described the uh, differences between the health programs that were going on in Nicaragua, which he'd taken part in and observed, and those that were going on in other programs. And it was very pro six Sandinista article. So that, that was the one exception apart from the Nicaraguan. So it wasn't 100 percent. It was like, you know, like 99 percent agreement that you got to overthrow the government. And, the only, and there was a division on how you do it. Uh, and that division was roughly 50-50. Uh, about half the writers said you do it by violence. Uh, you run a terrorist war, you know, you kill people, uh, torture them, and so on and so forth. They didn't use those words, but that's what it comes down to. You run the Contra war, and that will get rid of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the cancer, as George Schultz called it. That will excise the cancer. Uh, the other 50 percent, approximately, said uh, we should do it by more cost-effective means. Like, after all, it's a very weak, tiny country, and we're this huge, powerful monster. So we can just strangle them by economic strangulation uh, and by diplomatic isolation and so on. That'll work. And it's much more cost-effective. You know, it doesn't look so ugly as tortured children and that sort of thing. And it's going to work anyway. Uh, those were called the doves. Okay. Now, it's not that the, uh, uh, now, it's kind of interesting to compare this with the attitude of the business community, which is the dominant force in the United States. Uh, well, uh, if, if you really believe, you know, that the business community just controls the media, you'd predict that in, among corporate executives, say, there'd also be a 50-50 split on how to get rid of the cancer. But it turns out that's not quite true. It was about an 80-20 split, meaning about 80% of corporate executives were what are called doves. Uh, they thought you ought to strangle them by economic, illegal, of course, economic warfare and political isolation and so on. And only about 20% thought you ought to do it by terror. So in fact, the media were not precisely reflecting the attitudes of the business community. They were far more hawkish. That is, they went over more to the government side, which said, in this state corporate nexus there's of power, there are some divisions. And the media tended to be more on the state side than just on the corporate side. Uh, that's the basic conclusion that comes out. That's, uh, the media, you know, are always criticized for being too liberal and this and that. This is what you find over and over again, and the crucial role of the liberals has to be understood. If you look at the extreme doves, you know, people like, say, Tom Wicker in the New York Times, uh, he was very much opposed to the Contra War. He says it's not going to work, it's going to cost too much, and so on. Uh, he said we have to find other methods to restore the Sandinistas to regional standards. Now, you have to understand what regional standards are. Regional standards, for example, are the standards of, say, El Salvador and Guatemala, which were at that point terrorist states that we were supplying and training. We're kill killing maybe 200,000 people in those years. And not just killing, I mean mutilating, torturing, you know, uh, and so on. That's the regional standards. And from the dovish point of view, that's where we have to move them. Uh, on television, there's also a spectrum, you know. Uh, there's uh, talk shows, and there's, there's a representative of the left, if you watch television. He's called, named Michael Kinsley. He kind of represents the left view of things. And he wrote about this, too. He took the dovish view, namely that you shouldn't, uh, you know, he was against the Contra War, for sure. Uh, and, but he had a very interesting attitude. I mean, around this period, it was reviewed, in fact, the Southcom, the American Command in Panama that runs this whole show, uh, the Chief General testified in Congress, and he said, we're training the Contra forces to attack what are called soft targets, uh, not to duke it out with the Sandinistas, as he put it. So the idea is we're training our terrorist forces to avoid the military in Nicaragua, because they'll, you know, they'll get wiped out, and to go after soft targets, meaning that means civilian targets, things like health clinics and agricultural cooperatives and so on. Uh, well, you know, that aroused some 
questions. Uh, the State Department was then asked about that, and they said yes. Their spokesman, Charles Redman, stated officially, he said yes, uh, we authorize attacks on agricultural cooperatives and so on. And that's legitimate because the people there carry arms, so therefore they're authentic military targets. Uh, well, America's Watch, which is the leading human rights group, uh, challenged this. They're the only people who challenged it, as far as I know. The press saw nothing wrong with it. Uh, they challenged it and said, well, they asked him, do you mean, for example, that it's legitimate for, say, Abu Nidal terrorists to attack an Israeli kibbutz and murder children because people are armed there, as they obviously are? Well, I didn't get an answer. Uh, but Michael Kinsley picked it up and wrote an article in which he said, uh, we should not be too quick. He was critical of America's watch. And he said, we should not be too quick to condemn the resort to terrorist violence. We have to think about it first. We have to ask whether it is cost effective. Uh, and the way we determine that is by measuring what he called the amount of blood that is poured in against what comes out of the, whether democracy comes out of the other side, of course, what we call democracy, and we make that decision. Uh, so we have to measure, you know, the blood and gore that's poured in by the terrorism against the output, and if it turns out to be cost-effective, then we shouldn't really condemn the uh, attacks on soft targets. In fact, we should approve of them. Well, I'm now off at the far liberal end, you know, uh, and uh, the, the people in that position play a very significant role in a free society. They set the limits of debate. It's very important to denounce them as being anti-American and to call the New York Times the establishment left and to rage about how the press is under the control of liberals and so on. And in fact, it's not untrue. Like when Limbaugh and these guys say that, they're sort of right. Uh, and the reason is that in a well-run propaganda system, that's exactly what you do. If dictators have any brains, that's exactly what they would do. They would let the, their ideological institutions be run by people who define themselves as critics and in fact are sometimes kind of soft-hearted and you know raise questions about the amount of blood and gore that's poured in and that sort of business but who basically understand accept all the underlying premises uh, they would be the liberal critics you could then denounce them as being uh, anti whatever country it is i might mention in this connection that there's only two countries in the world that i know of where the concept of anti-X, X being the name of the country, is taken seriously. One is Stalinist Russia, where anti-Sovietism was absolutely the worst crime. You know, the biggest charge against anybody is anti-Sovietism. The other is the United States, uh, where you have respected books written by, you know, scholars called anti-Americanism, which are respectfully reviewed in the press, and they talk about people who are undermining the American way. Uh, in a country that had even a minimal democratic tradition, say Italy, if somebody were to publish a book in Italy on anti-Italianism, uh, people would just laugh, you know. I mean, try to sell that in Milan or Rome and so on. They think it's a joke. Yeah, sure, we're all anti-Italian because we're sane, you know. Uh, but uh, the, uh, but in, in countries with a real totalitarian culture, like, say, Stalinist Russia or the United States, uh, the notion anti-Americanism or anti-Sovietism is taken very seriously. And in fact, this goes right back to these extraordinary propaganda campaigns about selling the American way and, you know, un-American activities and so on and so forth. And again, these are, it's very striking that this should show up in a free society uh, and I think entirely natural. Well, what I just mentioned about uh, um, the Nicaragua case, that goes, I mean, that's standard. In fact, it's hard to find, uh, you know, the, uh, lots and lots of cases have been looked at. Hard to find a, uh, an, uh, any exception to this. I mean, you sometimes find that the media are not strictly following, say, the positions of corporate America, and it's typically like the one I just described. They're even harsher. Uh, where, there's a, where there's a break between state power and corporate power, the media often tend to move more towards state power. Uh, that incidentally goes on right now. So after uh, 10 years of uh, destroying Nicaragua through a terrorist war, actually that's not my judgment. Remember the United States was condemned by the World Court, the International Court of Justice, for the unlawful use of force uh, in its war against Nicaragua. Actually the media response to that was quite interesting almost 100% of the media, everyone dismissed it, of course, and almost 100% of the media uh, 
condemned the world court for discrediting itself by uh, accusing the United States of being the le world's leading terrorist uh, after a court hearing and uh, demanding that the United States uh, offer what would amount to billions of dollars of reparations. Uh, the, uh, the, New York, the, the world court was a hostile forum, as the New York Times put it, so therefore its decision didn't matter. You know. They're all there, anti-American too, as you can tell by the fact that they didn't like our terrorist activities. Uh, so uh, uh, after 10 years of, and of course we totally rejected it, and we forced Nicaragua to abandon its claims. Uh, we forced the Nicaraguan government to abandon its claims, which, to which they were entitled, the claims for reparations, on the threat of even worse if they didn't give it up. And there was actually an agreement made I don't think it's ever been published, and so far the New York Times won't even allow letters to the editor by international lawyers referring to it. Uh, but the, in fact, if you look at the, world, at the world court records, there was an agreement that Nicaragua said, okay, they'd abandon the claims uh, because they had made an arrangement that the United States would provide aid instead. That was the condition for abandoning the claims to which they were entitled. Uh, last uh, June or July, I forget, a couple months ago, uh, the Senate voted near unanimously uh, to curtail all aid to Nicaragua until Nicaragua demonstrated that it was not involved in terrorist activities and allowed the FBI in to investigate to make sure that was true. That's after we have carried out a 10-year terrorist campaign which destroyed the country, uh, which killed maybe 30 or 40,000 people, which left it at the level roughly of Haiti, uh, which was condemned by the world court, now we demand that they prove that they're not involved in terrorism, and that sails through the Senate without a vote, and of course without a comment in the press. A couple of days later, it got even, a couple of days ago, it got even more grotesque. Uh, the Senate passed a vote 94 to 4, which was, I didn't even see it mentioned in the press, it was on the wires. Uh, the, uh, maybe it was reported around here, the, uh, and I don't know who voted which way because they didn't give much information, so there were four people who didn't vote with it. It said we will cut off all aid to Nicaragua, that's permanent, uh, until it returns or properly compensates, we judge propriety, not like the world court, properly compensates for properties confiscated from Americans. What is properties confiscated by Americans? I mean, that means Somoza properties. That means properties owned by North American, Americans, under the Somoza period, under the period of this monstrous gangster uh, who was you know, torturing the population and the end of his rule killed maybe 40, 50,000 people with our support, and was finally driven out. People who had property under that tyranny were people who were participating in, in, in that. They had property because they were part of that system of tyranny and robbery. Uh, and unless their properties are returned, we're going to cancel that the fact that we had an agreement with them that had them you know, cancel their uh, uh, claims against us at the world court on condition we provide aid, of course, no even looks at that, no even knows about it, nor they will they know about it because press isn't going to allow it to be mentioned even in letters. Well, you know, these are levels of kind of arrog imperial arrogance that are extremely hard to achieve uh, in totalitarian societies. It's very hard to find counterparts to that. But you can do it when you have deeply instilled totalitarian values. So it doesn't occur to anybody to ask the obvious questions that the, such matters raise, and there's plenty of them. Uh, I, don't, I could go on and on with uh, more and more examples. As I say, there's a huge literature on this, but it's extremely systematic. Uh, if somebody can find an exception to this, it would be interesting to find. Nobody's found one yet. Uh, and the critique of it also doesn't matter since that doesn't enter public discourse. In fact, you could prove all of this with the certainty of physics, uh, and it wouldn't matter. Because in a properly controlled ideological system, the wrong thoughts are never spoken. Okay, so you just keep them out. Uh, and then corporate media, which are you know, linked to state and corporate power, that's not very hard. Uh, they're kept out of the academic institutions too, with, except for the most marginal exceptions. Uh, so, you know, people, it's a free country, so people are allowed to go around the country talking about these things, and some small publisher somewhere can publish a book, which if you can ever hear about it, you can buy, and there's a couple of journals around. Uh, so maybe, you know, like 1% of the population or something knows something about these things. 
uh, but and since it's a free society, you don't do anything to them, like you don't stick them in jail and that sort of business. Uh, but it's very important that the responsible men, you know, the people in the mainstream, they've got to be deeply indoctrinated. Now, I should finally add, let me last comment on this stuff. It's not in the least clear that this propaganda works for the general population. In fact, there's pretty strong evidence that it doesn't. Uh, so if, it, it certainly works very well among the educated classes. I mean, there it's just overwhelming. But if you look at the general population, it doesn't seem to work well at all. In fact, on issue after issue, the general population, we're a heavily polled society. There's a very good reason for that. Polls are mostly run by business. They want to keep their finger on the public pulse. You know, if you're running huge propaganda campaigns to control the public mind, you've got to know what people think. So the extensive polling, which you know occasionally makes it to the newspapers, but mostly it goes to the business community. And we know a lot about public attitudes on all sorts of things. And pretty dramatically, they're off the political spectrum on almost every issue. Uh, so you take, say, healthcare, which I mentioned before. Uh, there have been polls on health ever since the mid-40s. And while the establishment, you know, like the press, say, is like 100% against allowing the United States to join the modern world and to have the kind of health system everybody else has, the public has always been for it. Um, either majorities or considerable pluralities, you know, depending on the questions are asked, have been in favor of some version of national health care. Uh, the term that's used for that in the United States now is a Canadian-style system. The reason for the term is that people know that Canada exists, you know, it's close enough so that you sort of see it right there. But in fact, the Canadian style system is just a system everybody has, you know, except for us. Uh, and in fact, Canada has one of the least efficient of them. But uh, uh, most of the uh, a considerable majority, and that remains the case. Like if you read, the big, there's a huge media campaign now going on to try to ram through Clinton's new version of this insurance company-based, highly bureaucratic, very inefficient system. And the media are, again, about 100% in favor of it. But if you read the big articles, like you know these front page articles in the New York Times and so on, if you get down to you know second page, you know the continuation page at the bottom of the column, there'll be a comment that says 59% uh, of the population are in favor of a Canadian-style system, but that's not in the cards. Uh, it's not in the cards because it's called politically impossible. Politically impossible means big corporations aren't in favor of it, and the wealthy aren't in favor of it, so it's politically impossible. It doesn't matter if 99% of the population want it. Uh, the fact that 59% want it, or you know, whatever the number is, depending on how you ask the question, is a pretty remarkable fact, because they've never heard that anybody is in favor of it. You know, each person who says, I'm in favor of it, thinks I'm the only person in the world who's in favor of it, because they've never seen it anywhere else. You know? So those numbers are you know, extremely unusual. I mean, if the issues were ever allowed to appear, it wouldn't be 59% or whatever the number is, it would be overwhelming. And that's been true since the 1940s. There are studies of polls since the 1940s are quite consistently like that. And it just doesn't matter. As long as the public remain uh, spectators and not participants, it doesn't matter. Uh, and if you look at other issues, it's quite the same. So let's say take the Vietnam War. Uh, in, among educated people, uh, the spectrum is extremely narrow. Uh, the Vietnam War was, is considered, if you're a liberal, it was a mistake. Uh, our, I'm quoting now from the extreme liberals, our blundering efforts to do good turned into a disaster. That's Anthony Lewis, the New York Times. Or it was an excess of uh, disinterested benevolence and righteousness, uh, the leading academic critic of work, uh, John King Fairbank and so on. That's the kind of liberal extreme they were from there. But it was a noble cause in which we defended South Vietnam and maybe we made a mistake and maybe it was too costly to us so we should have gotten out or not gotten in. That's the general educated attitude. On the other hand, if you look at the population, it's astonishing. Well, they've never heard anything like this up until the most recent polls, you know, running from 1970 up till the present. About 70% of the population, plus or minus a few percentages, uh, have held to the position that the war was not a mistake. It was fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. Well, you know, that's not 
you know, that's a radical difference between the general population and the educated population. Uh, uh, it has a name, it's called the Vietnam Syndrome, you know, it's kind of disease that one of the Reaganite intellectuals called it sickly inhibitions against the use of military force, you know, phrase right out of the Nazi, it's Norman Butthorit. Uh, but they can't eradicate the disease from the general population, although there's been enormous efforts to do it. And if you go through issue after issue, you find something kind of similar, which is sort of striking. Uh, and raises some questions about whether the propaganda campaign is actually working among the public, but it's working in one important sense. It's got the public marginalized. They're in the spectator role. They're isolated, atomized, they may not like things and so on, but they have the feeling they can't do anything about it. Power somewhere else, which is not wrong, uh, but of course it doesn't have to be true. It's not a law of nature. Uh, uh, the, uh, there have been attempts throughout our history uh, to keep the bewildered herd bewildered and uh, you know not meddling in stuff that's not their affairs. Uh, repeatedly the public has broken through and done something about that and it can certainly do it again uh, but the beginnings of wisdom on this are to understand at least the way the indoctrination system works. for the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders to meddle <laughs> if you feel so inclined, so please uh, be as meddlesome as you like. Are there some microphones or? No, no microphones down there? Okay. Uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, here, that since uh, the last time I heard you speak at MIT 20 years ago, uh, when we were still in the heat of escaping for badgering myself about the Vietnam peace talks. And I know you know a lot about it and have written a lot about it. As a child of that period, in the sense of political awareness of what I thought it was, and I don't want to over-personalize this, but the historical frame of reference. And maybe if the average age here is 23 or 24 or younger, including the faculty, <laughs> a frame of reference on Nicaragua or the fight be battle. It, it does seem to me that you yourself have become almost cynical rather than enlightened and skeptical as you were then. In the sense that, while there clearly were efforts to control public opinion, both from the corporate business, military, industrial complex, whatever labels we wish to use, were very real things during the civil rights, Vietnam, women's movement, and then environmental movement of the 60s and 70s. Um, just for the purpose of lively argument, I would contend that this gradually, the people, some millions, some few millions of them, whether college students, workers out of work, <coughs> mothers of dead soldiers, were not at all uh, to be seen just as bewildered spectators, although it might have been nice if, for the power people if they stayed there. They got angry enough, they gave each other courage. We did some stuff, not that we won anything, but there was certainly a reshuffle, a reshuffling of this, now what they're calling totalitarian context. And I guess it's the term totalitarian that bothers me. I think yeah. what is valid is a kind of corporate collective or collective corporate system which would like to control in the way you have said. But don't succeed. I don't think we really have. No, I think there's a lot of participants yeah. that file suit on toxic waste and no, I agree. housewives for close connections. No, I agree. Yeah. But these aren't bewildered people. They're pissed off. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I had mentioned, and I should have said it more, but I mentioned, I mentioned that there have been two recent periods, three recent periods actually, uh, 
of massive propaganda efforts to try to drive the population back into passivity. The first was Woodrow Wilson's. The second was around late 30s through, you know, right after the Second World War, both of which succeeded. Uh, first one was broken by the Depression. The second was broken by what we call the 60s, you know. Uh, and as I said, the second one, the third one hasn't succeeded. Uh, in fact, if you look, I think what you said is exactly correct. I mean, what, are the, what I mentioned about the you know, Vietnam syndrome is an example, but the 80s were much more active than the 60s. So do we have a potential then? Oh, sure. What's that yeah. of reviving some notion of democracy? Sure, yeah. From... Yeah, of course we have. We have potentials always there, you know. I mean, uh, the, since the potential is always there, we don't live under slavery, and we do have the franchise and, you know, so on. Uh, if you look at the last 30 years, it's been dramatic. I mean, I constantly talk about this and write about it, and maybe I should have been more clear about it here, but I absolutely agree with you. I mean, the 80s were the most active period probably in American history, you know, at least recent American history, much more than the 60s. I mean, the 60s, there was a lot of protest and activism, and, you know, people of your age and my age remember it very well, uh, but it was pretty narrowly focused. I mean, it was uh, young people, and quite often in elite universities, and very narrow even there. You know. uh, the fact of the matter is, if you look, opposition to the war was greater as education declined. So it's not the case that the more educated you were, the more you opposed it, on the contrary. But uh, in a society that still had not escaped what I would continue to call the totalitarian values, I think the term is correct, of the 50s, uh, people who were opposed didn't do much about it. It was the people who were more privileged, who were in a position to do something about it. You got more leeway, you know. So the focus of protest was among young people uh, and very much university-based, which was extremely important. I think it was tremendously important, and a lot of things came out of it. But take a look at the 80s. Uh, the 80s was quite different. Uh, the solid, say, take just internet, free, I mean, uh, come back to the cases you mentioned, when you mentioned another one, uh, the solidarity movements of the 80s. Solidarity with Central America, which are the nearest counterpart to the anti-Vietnam War movement in the 80s, they were much broader than anything that existed in the 60s. And furthermore, they were much more solidly rooted in mainstream society. I mean, you found more solidarity work in a church in Kansas than you found in Harvard. You know, I mean, these this core of these movements was right throughout the Midwest and the Southwest, and uh, you know. Uh, people of any age, and no age business particularly. A lot of it was church-based. I mean, it was very mainstream American, and it involved, it was a huge effort. It went way beyond anything in the 60s. So in the 1960s, people were protesting, but nobody thought, I'll go live in a Vietnamese village because maybe a white face will fend off uh, state terrorists. They did it in the 80s. Uh, uh, people who we would regard as politically conservative, incidentally, and so would I, uh, went down and lived in villages, Witnesses for Peace, for example, precisely for that purpose. There was a lot of uh, solidarity work was people-to-people -people contact and direct involvement. Probably about 80,000 Americans went down to one or another part of Central America and really involved themselves in things. I mean, I have a daughter living down there right now who comes out of this. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and, you know, it was a major effect. I, I, you know, how much good it did to Central America, you can argue, it was very good for the United States kind of like the Peace Corps. Whether the Peace Corps ever helped anybody in the third world, you could debate, but it certainly helped the United States because a lot of people came back and understood that the world is not the way it had been presented to them. It's a different way. And that's very educational for us here in our highly indoctrinated society. And the solidarity work was the same. And it had an enormous effect. You know? And in fact, it continues. I mean, that's one of the reasons why, uh, and the government's aware of it. Uh, so, for example, uh, one of the early, uh, right in the peak of the Gulf War, you know, just when they were beginning the ground attack in the Gulf War, there was an interesting leak, you know, sort of back pages of the paper, uh, of an early Bush administration planning document on intervention in the Third World. And it said, uh, it said that uh, in the case of a conflict, in the case of a confrontation with a much weaker enemy, meaning the only kind we'll ever fight, obviously. In the case of a confrontation with a much weaker enemy, we must not only defeat them, but we must defeat them rapidly and decisively, 
uh, because of anything else will undercut political support, which is understood to be extremely thin. You know, there is very little, when, when John F. Kennedy sent the U.S. Air Force to bomb South Vietnam and to use napalm and so on, there was no protest. Nobody batted an eyelash. You want to bomb another country, your business. Uh, and nowadays, there's much too much public protest, public involvement. So that's all a big change, and I think it's the, one of the effects of the 60s. And the other things you mentioned are equally the case. The environmental movements, I'm take, say, the feminist movement, which came kind of like post-60s, it was just beginning then, you know. That's a, had an enormous effect on American life. The, there's the, all this huge fury these days about multiculturalism. Well, you know, any mass movement is going to have a lot of odd things around the periphery. But basically what it reflects is the sense that you should have uh, sympathy and concern and respect for other cultures. Well, that's something new, you know, and that, again, grew out of this. Or take what, in many ways, is the most dramatic example of all, uh, attitude toward the Native American population. Now, you know, the founding fathers were very well aware that they were, as they put it, exterminating the Native population, standard phrase, uh, because they are lesser breeds who, you know, world won't be any well worse off if they're gone and that sort of business. Uh, we went for hundreds of years without questioning that. You know, until the 1960s, nobody virtually, I mean, like you could find five people now and then who raised some question about whether it was appropriate to exterminate the lesser breeds. Exterminate, you know, that's what happened. And that's the way they described it. Uh, and, uh, and this includes all the guys who we think of as, you know, good guys. Uh, the, uh, in the 1960s, for the first, the, the academic profession was lying through its teeth about it. I mean, they had all the evidence, I mean, they were pretending up until the 1960s that the native population was sort of hunter-gatherers, you know, scattered around in the forest. They had plenty of evidence that there was a densely, you know, that the place was densely populated, that they had advanced civilizations, in many ways more advanced than the colonists. Uh, and, uh, you know, agriculture and all sorts of things, but they were pretending it wasn't there. Uh, there's kind of a reason for that. If they were hunter-gatherers, then according to English common law, they didn't own the land. They just kind of like wandering around. And if they didn't own the land, then, you know, well, nothing wrong with their taking it. Uh, but uh, that went on right into the 60s in anthropology. If some of you studied anthropology in the big universities in the 50s and the 60s, that's what you learned. If you grew up when I did, you played cowboys and Indians. Like as a kid, we played cowboys and Indians. You know, you go out in the woods and we're the cowboys and kill the Indians and that sort of thing. Uh, in the, uh, the 60s, that changed. And for the first time, it became possible at least to face the original sin, you know, even before slavery. Uh, what happened to the 10 or 12 million people who lived here, you know, and how come they're not here, you know? That's, you know, that's a serious question. And it took a couple of centuries to even open the question, and by now it's a major question, not that anything's being done for them, but at least it's a question. You know, people, are, it's among, I'm sure, all of you, uh, it's, it's not just something you laugh about now, you don't go out and play cowboys and Indians. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a tremendous cultural change. And in fact, across the whole, it's a much more civilized society than it was 30 years ago. That's precisely what strikes fear into the hands of elites. That's why they're so terrorized about what they call political correctness or, you know, the Vietnam syndrome or any of these other horrible things. Uh, people are not just accepting orders and they're beginning, they're asking questions. They are, in fact, off the spectrum on most issues. And, it's, and sometimes they do something about it. So I not only accept the criticism, but radically endorse it. I think it's exactly to the point and it tells you where you ought to go also. Question about Nicaragua. If, if George Bush put Noriega in power back in the days in the CIA, why did we have all the interventions in the first place? Noriega, you mean in, in Panama now? Yeah. Noriega was put in Panama. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting case. Uh, Noriega, who's, you know, it's kind of like a monk. I mean, now, now he's demonized and he's, you know, 40 years in jail and so on. But in fact, he was a kind of a minor thug. I mean, he was a thug and a killer and a narco trafficker and so on. But by the standards of the guys we support, he's, you know, not particularly noticeable. Uh, the, uh, in fact, there was just a trial 
uh, for, he was just tried in Panama for one of his worst crime, alleged worst crimes, killing a few uh, spot, uh, spot, uh, spot of fora. There's one, you know, a guy was decapitated, the dissident found some body somewhere. Everybody assumed Noriega did it. Uh, and Noriega was just tried for that, and everybody's amazement, they didn't convict him in Panama, which caused a big furor. Uh, and in fact, though you won't read it in the American press, if you read the conservative business press in Central America, you'll discover that the federal prosecutor had a theory, which he was, it was sort of the theory of the prosecution, uh, that in fact Noriega was involved, but he was involved as a CIA agent uh, who was trying to get rid of this guy because he was questioning the um, you know, war in Nicaragua. So uh, to get back to Noriega, he was on the American payroll you know, as a thug and a murderer and a narco trafficker of a minor type uh, until uh, about the early 80s. Uh, in 1984, in fact, uh, there was an election in Nicaragua which Noriega just stole by violence, quite a lot of violence, in fact. The wrong guy was going to win. The guy who was going to win is somebody called a, na he was a conservative nationalist, but somewhat independent, and the United States didn't like him, and wanted some other guy to get in, who in fact was a former student of George Schultz's, his name is uh, uh, Barletta, I think his name was, for, um, forgotten. Anyway, he was the guy who was supposed to win, and the thing was arranged so that he did win. Uh, the Reagan administration, which secretly subsidized his campaign, uh, sent him uh, congratulations seven hours before the election results were announced. Uh, George Schultz then flew down to authorize the, uh, uh, the great achievement, you know, challenging the Sandinistas to meet our high standards of democracy. That was 1984. You know, we're still not only supporting Noriega, but cheering him on, you know, when he destroys elections by violence and kills people and so on and so forth. Uh, well, around a year or two later, the attitude began to shift. The problem was that the thug was getting a little too independent. You know, thugs are fine. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's a minor one like Noriega or a major, major one like Saddam Hussein, or for that matter, Hitler, who we also supported for a time. Uh, they're fine, you know, as long as they follow orders. Uh, but if they become independent, they become as bad as priests who are organizing Bible study groups. Then they're bad guys, and you've got to get rid of them. So about 1986, 1987, the U.S. shifted its attitude toward Noriega, and instead of becoming sort of a nice guy on our side, uh, he became as Ted Koppel, and you know, those guys called him you know, one of the most odious creatures in the world, you know, the kind of people the United States... Americans love to hate, and so on and so forth. Major propaganda campaign was concocted to turn him into a sort of a Hitlerian figure. Uh, and that was all a buildup to the invasion of Panama, which incidentally, remember, was George Bush's celebration of the end of the Cold War. The invasion of Panama took place about a month after the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, and we were condemned by the United Nations. You know, the United States had to veto those two Security Council resolutions and so on. Uh, but they moved in. Uh, they, there's big furor about the fact that Noriega had stolen an election, which was true, although with much less violence than in the one in 84 that we endorsed. But this time he wasn't just following orders, so we invaded Panama, you know, killed however many people and destroyed what we felt like, and installed a regime of bankers and narco traffickers and uh, other crooks who everyone concedes, including the government, wouldn't stay in office for 10 minutes unless they had American force behind them. Uh, and the country's going down the tube, as you'd expect, the narco traffic, drug deal, drug laundering has about doubled since then. But they did kidnap Noriega and brought him here for trial. And if you look at the trial, the charges against him were virtually entirely from the period when he was on CIA payroll. Another slight fact that didn't appear in the uh, uh, press. But, uh, you know, well, that's another example of uh, Nice brainwashing. I mean, people in the United States, by the time we invaded Noriega, people, have, you know, much of the population was trembling in its boots about this Hispanic narco trafficker who was going to destroy our civilization. And, you know, the most odious character in the world, and we had to do something about it to protect ourselves. Well, that was effective propaganda. And it wasn't many years before, three or four years before, when he was a great guy on our side, having committed all his crimes. Crimes didn't come from the later period. That's why good propaganda works.
Same place the people in Russia looked, Samistad. I mean, there's, uh, there's plenty of sources of information around. Uh, first of all, you can learn a lot in the press. You know, it's not a controlled press after all. And if you really read it carefully, you can learn a lot. For example, take, say, this thing I mentioned about the Senate vote. I, mean, I don't know if it hit the press, but it was on the AP wires, so it's probably in the press somewhere or other. Uh, the, uh, uh, in fact, virtually everything I've described is somewhere in the press. You know, like if you take, take a look at the stuff about the health campaign, I mean, the fact that the majority of the population is opposed to the system that's being rammed down everyone's throat, well, that's actually in the press. It's true, it's hidden in paragraph 93, but it's there, you know, uh, and you can find it. So there's an awful lot you can find in the press in fact, if you do what you really ought to do. Start by reading every article from the end back to the front. You know, most of the lies are up in the front. And then as you get down to the story, you know, it turns out there's a lot of stuff back there. Apart from that, there's quite a range of other materials. I mean, from church sources, from dissident groups, from en environmental groups, from, you know, all the activist groups around them. So and they all put out a ton of material, and much of it is very valuable. Uh, the thing about the Panama trial that I mentioned is there, if you read the Central American press, it's in English, you know, it's too expensive to, you know, you can't subscribe to it unless you want to spend a couple hundred dollars, but a library could, probably isn't libraries. Uh, so there's plenty of sources of information. But the main answer to your question, I think, is that it doesn't matter how much information is around unless you have it accessible to you. And as an individual, you can't have it accessible unless you're an absolute fanatic. I mean, there are a small number of fanatics, I guess I'm one of them, who, you know, who, you know, devote their lives to trying to do it out of some kind of insanity. But normal people can't do that. You have lives to lead, you know. You can't act like a fanatic. Uh, and uh, that's why people have organizations. Like I mentioned churches in Kansas during the Nicaragua campaign. Well, you know, if you go down to those churches, people knew more about Nicaragua than the CIA and the more about El Salvador, because they were working together, you know. And they had act, in fact, I learned a lot when I went to visit places like that, and I thought I was following closely. Uh, if people work together, they can find out a lot of things, and they can furthermore get under, you know, they can gain understanding. You can't really have thought, you can't think independently if you're alone. I mean, anybody in the sciences knows this. Like, in the, in the natural sciences, you work together, you know. That's why you want to teach graduate courses, because the graduate students have all the smart ideas, and you interact, and you figure things out. Uh, but uh, any, anything where you're trying to really understand something is a collective activity of some kind. You try out ideas, and other people have them, and they react, and you know, somebody knows something you didn't know, and you put it together, and so on. And out of collective activity, you can find out a lot, but it requires organization. And in fact, the genius of American democracy has been to keep people very atomized. Well, I can tell you what I think is credible, but that's just believing what I think. There's no reason why you should believe that any more than you should believe anything else, you know? I mean, like, you know, I write in certain journals, and I think they're by and large credible, and I can tell you what I think they are, but my point is that there's absolutely no reason for you to trust my judgment. I mean, you know, why my judgment instead of uh, some guy who edits the New York Times? You've got to trust your own judgment, which means you have to look and see, you know? I mean, like, I write for Z Magazine, and I think it's credible, but that's my judgment. Maybe not your judgment. I, I have one other question. I was wondering about um, the propaganda message that Ronald Reagan used to cover up the depletion of the middle middle class. I was wondering on some of the methods they used and what was the most effective. Well, there was, uh, that's a very important fact. I mean, one of the things that happened in the 80s, I mean, there has been a decline since the early 1970s. There's been a decline of real wages. Uh, and a slowdown of growth. And that's not just in the United States, it's throughout the industrial world. And it has very big causes. I mean, too complicated to talk about now, but there's big structural reasons for that. Uh, uh, maybe mention it. But anyhow, it's been happening. Now, in the 80s, it intensified. Uh, the, it's policy run, it's policy driven. You know, it's not happening by laws of nature. Uh, and. Uh, the policies of the 1980s, particularly in Reaganite America and in Thatcher England, they were the most extreme, they accelerated. Uh, so there's a big, I mean, the, England is now back to the degree of inequality they had about a century ago. 
uh, and the United States is the the degree the inequality measures are one measure you can use of you know what's happening in a society. Uh, they were improving up until about the 60s in the United States, then they kind of leveled off, and they got way worse in the 19. Uh, 80s in every respect. I mean, child malnutrition, you know, uh, income, whatever you measure. Uh, how was this done? Partly by keeping the facts. I mean, people knew what was happening in their own lives. You know, like everybody knows what's happening to me. But it's very hard to find out what's happening everywhere. Uh, and in fact, the picture, the picture was that it was a period of great growth and prosperity and. Uh, Tom Wolf called it uh, one of the great golden ages in human history, or something. Uh, and there was a, you know, there was a, there was indeed a veneer of prosperity. And for some people, probably people in my income bracket, it was great. You know, gained a lot of money. In fact, there was some income growth. About 50 percent of it or more went to the top one percent. About 70 percent of it went to the top half percent, and the bottom 60 percent actually declined. So you get huge. Uh, differentiations, but people only knew what was happening to themselves. You know, they didn't see it on television. You know, they didn't. I mean, you, finally, it actually broke through. So, you know, there were some even popular books about it and so on. But uh, uh, the general picture of what's happening has certainly not been explained. I mean, you can see that South Central Los Angeles is exploding. Can't keep that quiet. But try to find an analysis of why it's true. There's some reasons why it's true. You know, take away the jobs, you send them overseas to places where you can really screw the workers properly, uh, and people who are left in South Central Los Angeles are going to starve. You know, not a profound point. Uh, and that's happening all over the country. It's called the internationalization of production, for example. Uh, and uh, it's supposed to be a good thing. You know, we're all told about how it contributes to economic efficiency and it's rational and some economist lectures you about free trade and so on and so forth. That's the story you hear. Uh, what's actually happening, people know from their lives. Uh, and in fact, if you look at, but, but they don't understand the picture because that requires putting it together. You know, uh, if you see, if you take, again, if you take a look at public opinion studies, you can see the way people feel about it. So for example, about 75% of the population thinks that life is going to be worse in the next generation than it is today. Now that's a real turning point in, in the history of industrial society. That's never been true. I mean, even the depths of the depression, which is way worse than anything now, there was a lot of hopefulness. You know, people felt it's going to get better some, somehow. You know, was, I, I can't remember that very well myself. Uh, but now people don't think so. Young people, for example, think they're not going to live as well as their parents. They may well be right, but that aspiration, that sense is very widespread. Uh, when polls ask people what they think about the economy, an astonishing figure, the last ones I saw were over 80%, say that the economy is inherently unfair, meaning requires radical change. Uh, as for the political system, about half the population thinks both political parties ought to be disbanded because they're totally useless. No, no way. Uh, so you have a tremendous amount of disaffection. It goes on and on like this. And people just feel individually that things are not going right. But uh, you, you are not going to find in the mainstream establishment literature much of an analysis of why or even that it is happening. And I think the basic propaganda method has been to focus, to di basically to distract people. So you watch, you know, sitcoms on television or you, you know, look at National League football or something. Do anything except pay attention to what's happening to you. Uh, and, and, and there's a strong effort to get people isolated. As you've been seeing over the tube lately, there's billions of dollars being poured into uh, the information you know, big information revolution, which is going to give everybody, you know, 500 channels, uh, which will all have the same garbage because they'll all be owned by the same people. Uh, but there'll be 500 of them now, so you'll really be stuck alone in your living room, you know, twiddling channels, trying to find something to do, and not talking to the guy next door with whom you might get together and maybe change things. Well, you know, that's a technique of propaganda. Uh, and an effective one. All of these things are very effective techniques. I mean, what I've been talking about is indoctrination, but that's mostly aimed at elites. That's like treetops propaganda. Uh, 
at the general public, propaganda is generally a distraction. You know, it's just keep the meddlesome outsiders busy with something else, whether it's sex or violence or gossip or sports or whatever, just keep them there and then they won't be any trouble and give them a picture of a kind of a glitzy world, you know. That's, I think, the way most of the public relations system work. Could you comment on the, what I feel is the beginning of our, the robbing of our grandchildren, money that haven't even earned yet in the 1980s, Reagan wanted to have trillion military buildup, and it's in relation to propaganda and yeah. the fact that the CIA had $30 billion supposedly to know it. Yeah. Yeah. So the question—I mean, the stealing of our grandchildren's money, uh, which was going on on a massive scale in the Reagan administration. Basically, that's what the debt is. You know, this huge explosion of debt is an imposition of a responsibility on future generations. Uh, and so, the same is true of the environmental issues. I mean, environmental issues are a matter of the welfare of future generations. In effect, notice that. Take, say, a market system, and there's nothing remotely like a market, but if there were a market system, it would have extraordinary deficiencies, fundamental deficiencies, one of them being that future generations can't vote in the market. You know, like they can't decide what they want the money to be spent, and they're going to be the ones who pay the cost. Well, that's essentially the issue that the environmental movement is facing, and things are like that across the board. How is it done? Well, you mentioned the military buildup, which was certainly one part of it. Uh, the CIA knew perfectly well that, in fact, you know, you could find it in the people, Russian, economists of the Russians, I mean, it's just not a secret, that uh, Soviet military expenditures were leveling off in the 1970s. They were always way behind us. I mean, even the most hawkish figures had NATO way outspending the Warsaw Pact. Uh, in fact, Soviet society was beginning to decline in the mid-60s and stagnating and military expenditures were leveling off. Uh, the Reagan administration had to ram through uh, an excuse for, they had this huge military budget. And remember what a military budget is. A military budget is mainly welfare for the rich. What we call the military budget is the technique by which taxpayers pay the costs of high-tech industry. You know, so that's how you pay off IBM and, uh, you know, uh, electronics uh, industry and aeronautics. Our, our biggest uh, export is aircraft. That's publicly funded. Uh, in fact, virtually every functional part of the economy is publicly funded. Uh, and of course, everybody knows that capitalism is completely unworkable. We try to impose it on third world countries to destroy them, but we don't accept it. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I never have, I mean. But uh, the military budget is one of the main techniques by which the state intervenes in the economy to funnel money from the taxpayer to the wealthy. And of course, the Reagan administration built it up. I mean, there's other functions like killing people and so on, but it has a major economic function. Uh, and you're right that that was one of the factors that built up the big deficits, ultimately huge debt, along with regressive fiscal policies, which gave the other shot in the arm. Uh, and how did they get people to agree to it? Well, you know, actually they didn't agree to it. Uh, if you look at polls again, the public was strongly in favor of social spending in favor rather than military spending. I mean, by big margins, you know, like four to one or seven to one, depending on how you ask the question. It just didn't matter. Uh, the thing to do at the time was to ram through a big military budget because the economy needed a shot in the arm and so on and so forth. How did they do it among the politically active class, you know, the responsible men, the educated 20% you know, or whatever it is, uh, the guys who actually play some role in these things, marginal or even at least. Uh, well, they just lied. Uh, if you go back then, you remember the reason we needed a huge military budget was because of something called the window of vulnerability. Remember that one? Uh, there was a window of vulnerability. The Russians had this fantastic missile system and you know they were going to destroy us all because we had this window of vulnerability and we quickly had to close it, you know, and that required, you know, all sorts of stuff. Uh, Star Wars being one of them. Uh, now, you know, they knew that the window of vulnerability was a total fraud. They knew it perfectly well. And in fact, it was kind of interesting to watch what happened to the window. It did close. The way it closed was by about 1983, corporate executives were beginning to get worried about the wild 
abandon with which the Reagan administration was spending money. I mean, they could see it's really it's harming what they care about, you know, the domestic economy. So they essentially, if you, if you look at corporate attitudes and pressures at that time, they were trying to get the Reagan administration to cut back on military spending. I mean, fine to pour a huge stimulus into the economy through public funds, but don't overdo it. You know, it causes real problems. They were beginning to worry about the deficit. Uh, and at that time, and shortly after that, the Reagan administration had a commission, the Scowcroft Commission, which discovered that there never had been a window of vulnerability. So therefore, we could level off military spending. Well, of course, there never had. It was a complete fraud in the first place. Uh, but it was there for long enough to ram through the military budget. Now, you know, the Reagan, Reaganites didn't invent this. In fact, they were simply following a script that was written by the Kennedy administration, who was their model. I mean, the Reaganites and the Kennedy people were extremely close. You look at policies, they were very, very similar. Uh, and, re and remember, that's supposed to be the opposite ends of the spectrum. But when Kennedy came in, uh, they bitter the Kennedy people bitterly attacked Eisenhower because he was letting the country fall behind the Russians and frittering away our resources while the Russians were marching from strength to strength and we had to have a huge increase in the military budget to defend ourselves. And it sounded just like the Reagan campaign against Carter, in fact, same rhetoric. And when the Kennedy guys came in, uh, they uh, also had a huge increase in the military budget, which set off the next stage of the arms race. And then it wasn't a window of vulnerability, it was a missile gap. In those days, there was a missile gap. You know, the Russian, we didn't have any missiles, and the Russians had all these missiles, and we were really in trouble. So we had to have a thousand minute men, and so on and so forth. Well, they knew that the missile, that the missile gap was a fraud, or to be more precise, there was a missile gap, but it was overwhelmingly in our favor. In fact, there were at that time four Russian missiles all of them sitting on some open airfield somewhere where you could probably bomb them in three seconds and probably not workable anyway. And we had a lot of missiles, uh, but they knew that. And they, now the records are declassified, so we know they knew it. But uh, as Mc this National Security Advisor, McGeorge Bundy said, he said, the missile gap is a good shorthand phrase for the policy we're intending to put through, so let's keep it. You know. So the, they had a missile gap, uh, and the Reaganites had a uh, you know, a window of vulnerability, and the Truman administration, the third big military buildup, they had another fraud, totally different fraud, but also a fraud, uh, and uh, that's the way it is throughout the Cold War. In fact, one of the big problems they're having now is that with the Russians gone, it's harder to concoct frauds. Uh, you know, the Russians were big and frightening and ugly and so on, so you convince, convince people, okay, maybe they're coming but it's pretty hard to do it when you, you have to fight Grenada or something. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the White House reports, the ones that go to Congress every year to tell you what, tell Congress why we have to bigger, have a bigger military budget, they of course drop the Russians. It's now the technological sophistication of third world powers that requires that we have this huge military budget. Or the rogue nations, you know, like Iraq's going to conquer Saudi Arabia and North Korea is going to conquer Japan or something. So we have to have the rogue nations under control. And they're really struggling to find some new enemy to uh, replace the Russians, because you need it for population control. But we know how they did. How the answer to your question is known, you know, fake window of vulnerability completely fraudulent, closed as soon as the business community said you're overspending, so therefore it was closed. It was as big as it ever was, you know, nothing had changed, but uh, you, you no longer needed it as a propaganda device. Professor Stonsky, you haven't uh, discussed the uh, 53, Vietnam in 61, Dominican Republic in 64, Nicaragua in 80, Grenada in 86, and more uh, recently, of course, the people of Haiti, and of course, the largest domestic group of victims of totalitarian values, African Americans. That's yeah. I mean, the correlation is dramatic, you know, but you have to be a little, I mean, let's take, say, Haiti, the current one. I mean, there's a history in Haiti where nothing is, you know, it's not, it's just didn't start today. In fact, the U.S. has over 200 years of involvement in Haiti. One of the first American foreign policy initiatives after the Republic, after we won independence in 1791, uh, was to uh, intervene in Haiti along with the French uh, 
who were trying to repress a slave revolt. There was a slave revolt, and Haiti was a French colony, you know, slave colony. And there was a big slave result, revolt, which the French were having a hard time repressing, so they called in other European countries to help, like Britain and so on. And the United States helped, too. You know, we sent money and forces to try to repress the slave revolt. When the slave revolt nevertheless succeeded, uh, the European countries refused to recognize it, uh, except by the, about the 1820s, they had mostly agreed to recognize it. Once Haiti agreed to pay indemnities to France, Haiti had to pay indemnities to France for the crime of liberating itself from French rule, which had totally destroyed it. That was considered rather legitimate, like you know Vietnam making amends to us today and so on. Uh, and the only country that wouldn't go along with that was the United States. We were much harsher. In fact, the United States was the last country to refuse to recognize Haiti. We recognized it in 1862 uh, in the context of the Civil War, and there were two reasons for that. Uh, one was because we needed Haitian bases for, the North needed Haitian bases for its military operations in the South, and the other is because they were going to free the slaves, and the idea at the time was, well, we're going to free them, but we're not going to let them stay here. Uh, the idea is send them somewhere, you know, get rid of the blacks in the United States. Uh, that Lincoln was, and Jefferson and others, that was a, one of their leading ideas. The idea, as Jefferson put it, is that we have to have a country without blot or mixture, meaning pure white. So, you know, the natives you exterminate and the slaves you send them back somewhere. Uh, and in fact, in 1862, the United States recognized both Haiti and Liberia. Uh, in large measure for that purpose. Uh, after that, we kept intervening in 1916, 15 uh, and 16. Wilson intervened. The Marines ran the place for 20 years. The reason it's in its present state comes from that 20 year occupation. And the racism there, you couldn't believe. Uh, if you, I mean, you know, I wish I had that stuff in front of me, but I've written about it. If you quote the Wilson administration on Haiti, it is mind boggling. Uh, the Secretary of State talked about how the problem of Haiti is that the African race uh, has no capacity for self-government, no talent for self-government, and they'll sink back into savagery, which is their natural condition, uh, unless we do something to rescue them. And, you know, it's just on and on with the most hideous racist garbage, including Franklin Roosevelt, who was involved in that. Uh, and and it, in fact, the racism of the invading forces very much sharpened and exacerbated the racism that was already present in Haitian society, where there was a split between the mulatto elites and the blacks that went way back. It got a lot worse in reaction to the racism of the American invaders, which lasted for 20 years. Uh, and it goes right up to the present. I mean, right now, uh, we, uh, when, uh, when Aristide won the election, the United States was appalled uh, not only because he was a representative of the black majority, but because he was a representative of a huge grassroots movement that nobody knew was there, and which, you know, a crisis of democracy in a terrible way. So when he was overthrown, nobody lifted a finger, and we're still basically not lifting a finger. The plan, I'm certain, is to, you know, certain as one can be in these things, uh, is to allow the killers you know, the kleptocracy in the military, to demolish and destroy the civil society so that if Aristide ever gets back and doesn't get murdered, uh, there'll be nothing much left in the way of popular support because it'll all be demolished. Uh, and, you know, that's been going on for years. And when, when it, if it finally happens, we'll praise ourselves about our grand contributions to democracy. And undoubtedly, there's a very strong element of racism in it. And you can go case after case, and the same is true. Like when Wilson invaded the Dominican Republic at the same time, uh, it wasn't the niggers that they were going to kill, it was the Dagos, except that they saw a difference. Because if you go back to Lansing, Wilson's Secretary of State, he said, uh, you know, the, the, the niggers, they don't have any capacity for self-government, and they're just savages, but the Dagos at least have some white blood, you know, so they're a little better and maybe we don't have to be quite as harsh on with them. Uh, and uh, I mean, in the late 1960s, Dean Acheson, or early 70s, Dean Acheson is one of the founders of the modern world, was privately advising the government of Rhodesia uh, that they should not 
uh, fall prey to this one man, one vote heresy, which has done such damage in the United States and shouldn't be under the uh, impact of these liberal absurdities, you know, and keep white rule and so on. And that's Dean Adges, you know, Truman's Secretary of State, one of the designers of the modern world. It goes right up until today. You look at the planning documents after the Second World War, when they were sort of figuring out how the world should be run. Uh, what they say about Africa is George Kennan, who was head of the planning policy section when he wrote about Africa, you know, he, he, each, each area had a certain function. He said Africa should be left for the Europeans, because we don't want it really, uh, and the Europeans should exploit Africa. He said that was the term he used. Europe should exploit Africa for its own reconstruction, because Europe's in a bad state, so therefore they had to exploit Africa. And then he added that that task, you know, that enterprise, would give Europe a kind of a psychological lift. I mean, they were kind of depressed at the time, uh, in part because of the effects of the war, and in part because we were stealing and taking for ourselves all of the traditional European empires, like, you know, South America and so on. And he said, this will give the Europeans, you know, some kind of task that they need that they can carry out and make them feel good, namely exploiting Africa. Well, you know, the races, I mean, you just look, everybody knows the history of Africa, you know. I mean, the, the racism in, implicit in that is beyond description, and deeper is the fact that nobody sees anything wrong with it. So you take a look at the diplomatic hit. This stuff has been declassified for, I don't know, maybe 15 years by now. I've, I've been writing about it, at least for that long. Try to find something, in the, even in the academic literature, where somebody says, wait a minute, there's something funny about Europe exploiting Africa to reconstruct, and because it'll give it a psychological lift. I mean, how about another project, like Africa exploiting Europe to reconstruct after centuries of destruction, and maybe they'll get a psychological lift out of it. I mean, if anybody proposed that, you'd just laugh. You know? And the reason is we're so fantastically racist that the other one, approach just comes naturally. Or take, say, this Middle East peace settlement. There's an example. I mean, U.S. policy toward the Middle East has been extremely racist. We're the only country in the world, in fact, which has flatly rejected Palestinian rights because they're just, you know, wrong color and everything else. And we won because the guys with the guns usually won, win. I mean, that's what all the euphoria is about. Uh, we ran through the rejectionist program that we've had isolated in the world, incidentally, for 20 years. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of racism behind this, undoubtedly. And the same is true domestically. I mean, you can find it all over the place. On the other hand, let me say that part of the reason, you know, it looks as if we're always attacking people of color, but that's a little bit of an artifact, in my opinion. Uh, because if you really look at the broad picture, what's happened for the last 500 years, essentially, you know, big brush strokes, is that a barbarian invasion took place from Northwest Europe, which swept over the world and destroyed most of the world. Now, Northwest Europe happened to be white. Uh, it wasn't more advanced than the rest of the world in you know, technology or anything else. It just happened to be much better at fighting. You know, they, their main advantage was military. It not only had the technology of war, it also had a kind of a culture of savagery that most of the rest of the world didn't have. It's not that the rest of the world was pacifist or anything, you know, they killed each other and so on. But, you know, from the East Indies, what's now Indonesia, to the United States, uh, a common reaction was that no one had ever seen people kill with the savagery and fanaticism of the European invaders. It was really something different. And both that culture of savagery and the technology of it and a bunch of other things, in fact, led to a world conquest. And the end result of that world conquest is more or less, you know, white people killing non-white people. Now, it's not precise, you know, but at least it's this strongly in that direction. In my opinion, if uh, some white people were to somewhere get up and declare independence, we try to kill them. In fact, that's what the Cold War was about. People of East Europe were perfectly white, you know, blonde, blue-eyed, all that kind of, kind of stuff. Uh, but we fought a 70-year war to drive them back into the third world where they belong. That's called the Cold War. And maybe 500 years from now, some Amer academic historians will be able to face that fact, but it's pretty clearly what happened. I mean, in a certain sense, the Cold War was not all that different from the invasion of Grenada. Uh, 
East Europe was a part of the Third World. In fact, it was the original Third World, even pre-Columbian. It was Europe, Western Europe's Third World. They declared independence. That's not permitted any more than if Grenada starts running fishing cooperatives. And when they do it, you smash them. Uh, Grenada it takes a weekend. You know, Eastern Europe takes 70 years. Uh, but that's a matter of scale. And they were white. You know, we would have nuked them, but they were white. Uh, and any other form of uh, independence, I think we would react to the same white, green, black, anything else. Although the bias is there, and largely a historical residue, a residue of the barbarian conquest uh, from Northwest Europe over the rest of the world. I don't know what you mean by that. When you say family values, what do you mean? Like, do you mean, for example, ensuring that children don't die of malnutrition? Is that family values? I agree that most of the public believes in that. Means what? No, most of the public is in favor of choice, always has been. I mean, the United States is different from other societies in that respect. One fact about American society, which is quite true, is that it's deeply fundamentalist. I mean, we're kind of like Iran, if you look at most measures. And it's unusual among industrial societies in that respect. It is quite true. Uh, yeah, OK, I've got to leave in a minute, I'm told. But uh, the point, I mean, there, there is some significant truth to what you're saying. A very substantial part of the public is kind of the counterpart, you know, has the same attitudes as deeply committed Islamic fundamentalists. Uh, that's not true in most societies. So if you look at uh, beliefs, you know, a lot of studies again, about 75% of Americans have a literal belief in the devil. You know. uh, about the, the percentage of Americans who believe in, our, in Darwinian evolution is under 10%. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the whole range of other things like that, 40% uh, of Americans have undergone a born-again experience. Now, you know, these are all deeply fundamentalist views. And they sh it's interesting that, and the United, uh, uh, what's striking is how far off the, you know, the, the uh, graph the United States is on this. Because if you look across the world, a lot of comparative studies, these beliefs tend to decline uh, with industrialization and modernization. It's a very close correlation, in fact. The United States is off the chart. You know, it's like the most pre-industrial societies in this respect. Sometimes this is called family values, but it sounds like a funny term to me. Uh, pardon? You've got to call on one woman before you finish. Yeah, right. OK, you'll be next. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it's my fault if I haven't. Uh, but you know th these are all true, and it's perfectly true that it, that the press basically doesn't go along with this. The press typically is not fundamentalist, uh, and in that sense, you could say the liberal press is different from much of the country. Uh, but that's about the only respect I think. So I suspect that most journalists probably believe in Darwinian evolution, like they don't think the world was created six thousand years ago or something. Uh, and in that respect, they are different from a large part of the public. And I suspect that a large number of journalists don't literally believe in the devil, say. And so they'd be different from 75% of Americans. Uh, Would you say that those fundamentalists are part of the bewildered herd trying to maintain control and the press is trying to possibly about that? Well, see, I don't quite agree with that because I think that part of the... Re I mean, here, there's an interesting question, and I don't think, you know, I don't really glib about it. It's short and... The, you know, really requires some thought. And actually, I don't think we know the answers. But my strong suspicion, if you want my suspicion, is the reason that this extreme fundamentalism in the United States, which makes us look kind of like Iran, is one of the techniques of indoctrination. That is, it's the result of indoctrination. It's one of the ways in which people have become marginalized. 
And in fact, if you look at the history, you'll find that back to the 19th century, the business community was funding and trying to stimulate, you know, fundamentalist preachers and so on, very much the way the uh, rising bourgeoisie in England did uh, earlier, simply to try to uh, get people from worrying about this world in which they were going to be oppressed. One of the ways you try to prevent people from interfering with what you're trying to do to them in this world is get them to think about some other world. Uh, we do it overseas all the time. One of the major efforts in Central America for years, and this one's known, is an effort to try to uh, bring in evangelical Christianity of a kind which says, don't worry what's happening to you in this uninteresting and insignificant world. Uh, you know, worry about you know, whether you get to heaven or something like that. That's a standard technique of control. And there's plenty of it in American history, and in my opinion, it's an opinion, you know, I haven't really been settled. This is a large part of why the United States is so different. So I would tend to suggest that these differences, though they're definitely real, I think they're more a reflection of indoctrination than a, something that the press is trying to block. But if it is, I mean, to the extent, say, that the press comes out against the teaching uh, creationism in the schools, it certainly is uh, opposing a significant part of the American population, which thinks that the world was created 6,000 6, years ago, and that's what we ought to teach. And it's absolutely true that elites don't agree. That's not the liberals, incidentally. Corporate executives agree. I mean, they don't want managers who live in a world of total irrationality. I mean, they want people who are going to be able to deal with the real world. Uh, so if you looked at corporate executives, they'd probably be even more opposed to uh, teaching creationism in the schools. Yeah. <laughs> You're getting into my question. Sorry. <laughs> what I was thinking about recently is censorship. And perhaps the most insidious form of censorship is self censorship when you know that. And you think, oh, but I don't think I want to really go out as strongly on this as, as I could, and maybe I'll just want to see it. But the thing you were talking about with the, the school, the teaching, uh, while the school boards may be able to resist fundamentalist uh, pressure to teach creationism, I still then see a very strong uh, Darwinian approach in teaching evolution. It's like, oh, we don't want to get into that because it'll Too dangerous, yeah. We'll just concentrate on the Other things, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing new about that. And so, I mean, my wife uh, was a student at University of Pennsylvania around 1950, and I remember she took a sociology class, uh, undergraduate sociology class, when they, you know, they got to Darwin somehow. And the professor opened the discussion by saying, "Well, look, uh, I'm going to be talking about something that's very controversial, and none of you have to believe any of this stuff." But it's something you sort of ought to know about. I mean, there are people who believe it. Uh, so therefore, you know, we'll teach it. I mean, when they taught the laws of mechanics, they didn't say that. So there's nothing new about this. This goes way back. Yeah. Yeah, but this was the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. 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 Y
of the kind you don't find in the industrial world. And you know, that's a dangerous mix. I mean, it's the kind of mix which has led to things like Nazism. Uh, so I don't think it's anything to joke about. Uh, and I think it's quite real. But when people say the liberal press is opposing it, I think they're missing the point. Corporate executives are way more opposed to it uh, because they want a rationally run society. I mean, they may not care if people out there, you know, the working people believe in the devil. They may like that because then they won't worry about not having any jobs. Uh, but they want a spectrum of people who know where the real world is, who can do their work for them. And if it extends too far, they don't like it. I have to leave them for it.